Amen and amen. Good morning, Life Church. <laughs> I think that was zero reaction, so that's a first for me. Um, anyway, we'll just power through. I'm glad that you're with us. Um, I hope that you, you know, have a pulse and intend to react to something that I say. Um, if we don't know one another, my name is James Sharp. I'm one of the elders here, and I'm not in the habit of rebuking you right at the beginning. And so I don't know where that came from. It's been an inauspicious beginning to the morning, um, an inauspicious continue, continuation of the morning, but now we get to turn to God's Word, and I hope that proves auspicious. Um, yes, so today is uh, a family worship weekend here at Life Church. That means that we have a few extra young children in the room. We might be a little bit more enthusiastic than is typical, and that is a good thing. Parents, if you're stressed by that, I pray that you wouldn't be. We just kind of lean into whatever um, noise and energy and chaos that brings for us. We really love it. The church is a family. Families sometimes are chaotic and noisy, and so we're glad if yours is with us. Kids, let me just talk to you for a quick second, um, because I know that what's about to happen will make it seem like everyone here thinks that I'm a really important person, right? I'm going to stand here, and I'm going to talk for like 40-ish minutes, um, and that might make it seem to you like... I think my voice is a big deal, um, and maybe it is. You can decide. Uh, but I want you to notice something. This is really important to me. I say this often on Family Worship Weekends. Um, I want you to see that my Bible is hanging out over the edge of my pulpit right here. And we do that because I want everyone to remember through this visual symbol, right, that the voice that really matters in this moment isn't mine. It's God's voice, and God has spoken to us through his word and the only degree to which my words mean anything of consequence to us today is the degree to which they line up with the Bible that's in front of me. And so I'm in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That's the passage we're going to be studying, verses 13 through 18. If you have a Bible, if you're young or old, um, I hope that you turn in your Bible to that passage, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. I pray that we will hear God speaking to us from that passage in our time together. Today's the final week in um, a series that we've called This We Believe. We've been preaching with a view toward our statement of faith. Uh, we're thinking about the convictions that shape and guide us as a church. This morning, we're thinking about the convictions that shape and guide us as we think about the end of the world. Perhaps you are of the opinion that Christians believe some pretty bizarre things about the end of the world. In the television show Parks and Recreation, there's this recurring bit about a cult group called the Reasonableists. The Reasonableists believe that the world will end in fiery judgment when the lizard god Zorp appears and consumes all things. Hail Zorp. It's a bit that crops up every few episodes, in, or I'm sorry, in a few episodes over the course of the show. And one of the characters at one point asks the question, why is this cult called the Reasonableists? And one of the other characters answers, well, they chose that name so that when people criticize them, they'll seem like they're criticizing something reasonable. Which is all well and good, but um, one day I was watching the show, as I'm prone to, and I was laughing at the Reasonableists, the way the writers of this comedy show are intending me to laugh at the Reasonableists, and it occurred to me that those writers were really poking fun at me. And they're probably poking fun at you, too, if you believe, as the Bible teaches, that the world as we know it will end. If you believe, as the Bible teaches, that at the end of the world, there will be fire and there will be judgment. Christians do believe some pretty bizarre things about the end of the world. But as our passage this morning will show us, those beliefs, they flow from something that is not bizarre, but powerful. And those beliefs point us to the very heart of what we yearn for and desire as people. Those beliefs offer not some wild speculation about the future and not fodder for satire or situation comedy. Those beliefs offer something that we all desperately need. They offer hope. 
Let's see that as God speaks to us this morning in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. I'll read God's word for us. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, and with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Life Church, this is God's word for us this morning. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Pray with me. Lord, as we have sung, so we now pray this morning. Give us eyes to see more of who you are. Uh, May your spirit shine light in the dark corners of our understandings and hearts that we may, through this passage, behold the beauty of the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. So I should start this morning um, by just pointing out the movement of the passage. I think it's important. And so I want you to look with me at the beginning and the end of the verses that we just read. So we're going to compare verse 13 for a minute to verse 18 so they can see where the passage is going. That's what I want to kind of show you or illustrate for you. And so in verse 13, the Apostle Paul, who's writing to Christians in a place called Thessalonica, he's addressing a problem that the Thessalonians are experiencing. In particular, they were ignorant about the future. Look back at verse 13. He says, we don't want you to be uninformed, or we might say we don't want you to be ignorant, out of the loop, in the dark. We don't want you to be clueless, brothers about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Now, often in the Bible and in this passage, that idea of being asleep, it's not referring to taking a nap, it's referring to death. And Paul's saying that the Thessalonians are uninformed, they're ignorant about those who are dead. And that ignorance, it's creating in them kind of an uncertainty and even a despair They're acting like they have no hope. They're grieving like they have no hope. That's how the passage begins. And I wonder if some of us might relate. A lot of us have anxiety or uncertainty about the future. And a lot of us might have questions about death. Like, kids, you're here in the room with us. Maybe you have questions about death. What happens to us after we die? Or what happens to those we love after they die. The good news for us today is that this passage right here is intended to give us hope as we think about the things that we don't know about the future. Now look at verse 18. Paul writes, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another. So verse 13, we're we're uncertain We're uninformed, we're ignorant, to the point of despair. Now, verse 18, encourage one another. How have we moved from point A to point B? How have we moved from this place where Christians were uninformed and uncertain and ignorant to the place where now they can be encouraged? Well, the answer is with these words, the last words of our passage. Paul intends for these verses in 1 Thessalonians 4, to encourage us. He intends for these verses to move us from uncertainty and despair and ignorance 
to a place where our hearts have encouraged, lodged in them because of the words that he writes. So, what does he say? What are the words that he writes all about? Well, we find in this passage like a statement of Christian hope. We find the Apostle Paul writing to despairing Christians to encourage them by giving them hope. And as we unpack the passage, we're really going to see that there are four distinct things that Paul says about the hope that Christians have. Are you worried or anxious or uncertain about the future? Then these verses are going to help you. Do you have a measure of fear about death or about the end of the world, then these verses should help you. Because Paul's writing to encourage the Thessalonians and us with hope. He wants us to grieve with hope. And he points us to four distinct things about biblical Christian hope. And so that's my outline today, just four things about biblical Christian hope that we can see in this passage. Let's start with the most obvious of them. Number one, Christian hope allows room for grief. Christian hope doesn't ignore grief. It doesn't explain grief away or pretend grief away. It allows room for grief because grief is the right response to death. Now, perhaps you at some point in your life have been to the funeral of a Christian, like a beloved brother or sister in Christ who has preceded us in death. And perhaps people at that funeral or around the space of that funeral have said things like, well, on this day, we don't really need to be sad because we know that so-and-so is in a better place. And we can appreciate that statement. There's some truth to that statement, but we also need to acknowledge that it is only a half-truth. Because Christian hope does not eliminate grief, it informs and explains grief. And it allows for the fact that grief is the right reaction to death in the world because death is only in the world on account of sin, right? Death is the consequence of sin. And we see in his life that even Jesus grieved over the reality of sin in the world. Jesus at the tomb of his beloved friend Lazarus in John 11, he wept, he grieved, even though he knew that in just a few moments he was going to speak words and Lazarus was going to come bursting from the grave, he still grieved over the death of his friend. Why? Because it's right to grieve sin and its effects in the world. And this is not how God created us. This is not what God intended. Sin is not a part of his plan and it's right to grieve over the brokenness of the world. As Christians, we grieve with hope, but that means that we still grieve. We grieve knowing that sin and death don't have the last word, but we still grieve. It's at this point that I'll appeal to you this morning if you are with us and you are not yet a believer in Jesus Christ. If you are here and you haven't trusted in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, if you haven't turned from your sin and repentance and faith, then I want to submit to you that you are left with nothing but a hopeless grief in the face of death in this world. And I pray that you're honest with yourself about that this morning. Like when your loved ones die or when you anticipate your own funeral, you must do all of that without any hope in something that's greater than the sorrow and pain that you feel. And perhaps you're cold and casual about that. Perhaps you think about your own death and you say, who cares what comes after that? I'm just going to eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Well, let me tell you why you should care about that. Because if you live in this life without any hope beyond this life, then you actually set yourself up to be completely miserable today, right? If you have no hope that endures beyond tomorrow, then you're exposing yourself to a great deal of misery today because that means if this life is all there is, if your mantra is eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, then you better have a pretty good time in this life. And if you don't, you've got nothing. Right? And so when sorrow and sadness and trial and turmoil come, and they will inevitably come, 
You have no equipment with which to deal with that. You have no, no resources that you can draw on to fight against the despair that can creep in in this life in a broken world. Right? All you've got is live it up and hope that you can have a really good time today because you have no hope for tomorrow. But if you're a Christian, the fact that we can grieve with hope, it does equip us to deal with any and every trial that will come our way today. Because even in death, which is the worst thing that can happen to us, even in death, we still have hope. Right? There's still life to come. There's still resurrection. Jesus will still return. There is still glory. Death cannot rob you of any of those things. And so we can grieve with hope. Christian hope, it allows room for grief. Number two, Christian hope is grounded in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Look back at our passage, especially at verse 14. This is clear. Paul, he says, for, so here's the foundation, since we have believed that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Now, there's, there's something future in what Paul says there in verse 14, and I'll deal with that in a minute. But notice the beginning of verse 14, because Paul gives us the, the very sure and certain and solid foundation that all Christian hope is built upon. What is it? It says, since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we can have hope. Now, how do the death and resurrection of Jesus give us hope? Well, in so many ways. Right, because of the death of Jesus, all who trust him in saving faith can be forgiven of their sins. Because of the death of Jesus, the full penalty of sin is satisfied. The full price of our forgiveness is paid. Because of the death of Jesus, we are reconciled to the holy and righteous creator of the universe. Whereas once, because of sin, we were banished from his presence, now we are citizens of his kingdom. Whereas once, because of sin, we were enemies of God, now we're adopted into the family of God as sons and daughters, whereas once, because of sin, we were under condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus because of the death of Jesus. And because of the resurrection of Jesus, the sting of sin, which is death, is defeated forever. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, all who are his are now a new creation. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, his people will one day rise from the grave just as he did. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, his people will one day inherit glorious resurrection bodies just like his resurrection body, a body that is free from sin and sickness and death just as his body was free from sin and sickness and death. What we're really talking about here is the doctrine of our union with Christ. What the New Testament teaches us is that for Christians, everything that is true of Christ, past, present, and future, is transferred to us because of a mysterious spiritual union between Jesus and us. If you're in the room as a follower of Jesus, then Jesus is in you and you are in him in such a way that what is true of his past is true of your past and what's true of his present is true of your present and what will be true in the future for him will be true for you as well. And so Jesus has died. And when Jesus died, God the Father looked upon him and thought of you. So the full measure of your sin was done away with on the cross. Jesus, before his death, he lived a perfect life. And when Jesus lived that perfect life, God the Father looked upon him and thought of you. So the full measure of the favor and approval and delight that the Father felt for the Son because of his perfect obedience, it's considered yours. That's the way the Father feels about you. And when Jesus rose from the grave in power and glory, God the Father looked upon him and thought of you. For Christ secured for you, too, a resurrection from the grave. 
No, you did not have power over death, but he did. And you are in him, so that power is yours. What's true of Christ's past is true of your past. What's true of Christ's present is true of your present, somehow mysteriously. We can't grasp all of this. But Ephesians tells us that Christ is at this moment seated at the right hand of the throne of God and that we are seated with him. And so there is some way in which spiritually at this moment, because of our union with Christ, we are in paradise forever. And then what's true of Christ's future? It's true of our future because of our union with Christ. Jesus will come again one day in power and glory, and when he does, the Father will look upon him and think of us, which is why Colossians can say, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Glory is your future and mine because that is Christ's future. This is what union with Christ means for followers of Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, his past, it's your past, his present, it's your present, his future, it's your future, which means that your hope is secure because of Christ. It's solid, it's real, it's as if you can touch it, you can build your life upon it. Most of the time, when we use the word hope, we really mean something like wishful thinking. We'll say, I hope that it doesn't rain tomorrow so that we can go to the park, which means I wish that it won't rain tomorrow so that we can go to the park. We'll say, I hope Duke demolishes Carolina in the ACC this year, which means we wish that Duke would demolish Carolina in the ACC this year. We might say, I hope that Sharp stops talking soon so that we can get out of here and on to lunch, which means we wish Sharp would stop talking soon so that we can get out of here and on to lunch. In each of those things, we have no certainty to base that on. We're not talking about something that's real and solid. No, we're talking about what we desire, what we long for, what we wish. But biblical hope, it's different than that. It's not wishful thinking. Right, because biblical hope, it's based on something real and solid and certain. It's based on the death and resurrection of Jesus. These are historical realities. The church has been sure of them for 2,000 years, and they therefore form the foundation of our certain future. Even in death, we can have hope because we will be resurrected with Christ and appear with him in glory upon his return. Christian hope, it's grounded in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Here's the third thing. Christian hope, it transcends life and death. Look again at verse 15. Paul writes, for this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. The point Paul's making is that this Christian hope, it's available to, it's real for those who are alive when the Lord comes and for those who are asleep or dead when the Lord comes. In other words, Christian hope is not limited to this life. It's a hope that continues even into death. It transcends life and death, which means that Christian hope is the only hope that you can take with you to the grave. Anything else that you might hope in, anything at all, no matter how good, no matter how sweet, any other hope will abandon you in this life or at the moment of your death. In this life, you might hope in your relationships, but those relationships are going to end. In this life, you might hope in your possessions, but those possessions are going to be someone else's possessions the moment you breathe your last breath. In this life, you can hope in your success or your reputation or your social status or your health or your family or your influence. We can hope in so many things, but every one of those things will fail us in the moment before we breathe our final breath. Christian hope, it will never fail you. It never leaves you. For both the living and the dead, 
Christ is coming to redeem his creation and to bring his people into the kingdom. Here's the fourth thing the passage teaches us about Christian hope. The passage teaches us that Christian hope is focused on Christ's presence. Look with me again at verses 16 and 17. Paul, he wrote, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Most of us won't be aware of the fact that these two verses, verses 16 and 17, are among the most debated verses in the entire New Testament over the last 100 years or so. Why are they so debated? Well, Paul, he's describing an event in the future, and he believes that that future event should bring present encouragement and hope for the Thessalonian believers and for us. But what event exactly is he describing? Well, let's notice a couple things that I think are really clear in the passage. First, I want you to notice the things that mark the arrival of this event. You know, what does verse 16 say will happen when this event begins? Well, there will be a cry of command from heaven. We'll hear the voice of an archangel. We'll hear the sound of the trumpet of God. Now, each one of those things, like, alludes to other passages in the Bible that we could talk about, um, and they might help us understand exactly what is happening in this event But the main thing I just want you to notice today is that this is a pretty public event, isn't it? I mean, you aren't going to miss a cry of command. You're not going to miss the archangel's voice. You're not going to miss the trumpet of God. Kids, do you ever feel like you're talking to your parents, but they're just not listening to you? Right, like you're trying to get mom's attention, but she's busy, like with some chores about the house or work or something like that. Or you're trying to get dad's attention, but he won't stop watching the TV or staring at the glowing rectangle in his hand. Do you ever feel like you're saying things and your parents just aren't listening? Parents, do you ever feel like you're saying things and the words are going in one ear and out the other when you talk to your children? Right? They're hearing you, but they're not really hearing you. I think we all know that experience, either on the giving end or the receiving end. This event, it's not going to be like that. The signs and sounds that indicate that it is here, I don't think anyone will miss those signs and sounds. Everyone will hear them. Everyone will take notice. It's a very public event. Second, notice that the dominant image that's described here points to the glory of Jesus. Right, Paul talks about the clouds, right? He says Christians, whether they've already died when this occurs or if they're still living when this occurs, they're going to be caught up to meet Christ in the clouds. What's left a little bit ambiguous is where exactly those clouds are. I mean, maybe they're in the sky. Maybe they've descended to earth. But the point is, why clouds? Well, anytime the Lord appears in glory in Scripture... He's surrounded by clouds. When the Lord appears before the Israelites at Mount Sinai, he appears in a cloud. When Jesus is transfigured before Peter and James and John on the Mount of Transfiguration, he's surrounded by a cloud. And on this day, when Christ appears and is reunited with his people, living and dead, he will appear in a cloud. Why? Because he will be glorious, and his glory will be unmistakable. Third, Notice that reunion is the point here. Jesus being with his people, that's what this is all about. Paul makes that most clear at the end of verse 17. He says, after all of this, we will always be with the Lord. Right? The point of this event is the eternal and inseparable and undying reunion of Christ with his people. Now, you might ask, okay, 
What's so debatable then about what this verse teaches? Let me tell you. And this is where I'm very aware that um, I could step on somebody's toes. And I just hope that you know that I do that in love and that I do it as humbly and gently as I can. Some of us, we've been taught, either by Bible teachers or by books and movies about the end times, that before Jesus returns, there will be something, I'll call it a secret rapture, a secret rapture that, that takes the church away, right? And so this secret rapture, it involves God's people basically disappearing in the blink of an eye, leaving behind confusion and tragedy. Sometimes when this is depicted, you see mothers panicking because they, they can't find their children anymore because their children have been caught up and cars and airplanes are crashing all over the place because their drivers and their pilots have been caught up and the people then who are left behind are forced to figure out what everything means. The question we need to deal with is that really what the Bible teaches. The word rapture technically never appears in the Bible. The closest we get to it is here in verse 17. There's a Greek word, harpazo. My translation translates that caught up. Harpazo, when it's translated into Latin, so now we're talking about the Latin version of the New Testament, that word, it has the same root as our English word, rapture. In other words, right here, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, this is everything that the Bible says about the rapture. It's it. What does this actually teach us? Well, yes, God's people in the blink of an eye are caught up and meet Christ in his glory. But I would suggest from this passage that there's nothing secret about it. Archangels are shouting, trumpets are blaring. When this happens, everyone will know. And there will no be mistaking Jesus when he appears in glory. No one will be left behind wondering what has happened. Furthermore, there's nothing in this picture that makes us think that this rapture of the church will be followed by a period of confusion where Christians try to figure out what is going on or where people repent and turn to the Lord. The only thing that we can conclusively say is that Christ's people, I believe this means all of Christ's people, Christ's people will be with Christ forever, and so we will always be with the Lord. But the picture here is not of Christians being caught up and meeting with Jesus only to leave the rest of fallen humanity behind. It seems to me the picture here is of Christians being caught up and meeting with Jesus and forming the triumphal procession of our heavenly king as he comes to reign in power and glory upon the earth. In other words, the hope that Paul is really pointing us to here is the hope of Christ's rule and reign and presence among his people for all eternity. Church, we shouldn't hope for an escape from this world and all its troubles. We should hope for the redemption of this world and all its troubles. We should hope for the moment when Jesus returns and brings his kingdom fully and finally to the earth, the moment when he returns to rule and reign over all creation and to be with his people forever, that is the substance of Christian hope. That's the truth that Paul is pointing us to here. And whether you know it or not, that's the thing that you are really longing for in life. On my phone, um, I have this app. You probably have something like it. Um, it curates all of my photos. And so our photos don't live in you know, photo albums anymore. Um, I can't remember the last time we picked up like a three by five. Um, our photos live in the cloud, and so hopefully you know, Russia doesn't launch some space satellite that can knock out the cloud and we lose all of our photos because I'd be sad about that. But our photos, they live up there. I don't understand that. What I do understand is that, like, from the glowing rectangle in my pocket, I can get them whenever I want them, and so I'm happy about that. But on this app in particular, um, my wife and I, we share a photo library, and this app curates all of our photos so that on any given day of the year, 
we can see every photo that we've taken on that day of the year over the years. Um, and if we were just taking photos of ourselves, like of Kristen and me, I don't think we'd be very excited about this app because, I mean, I haven't had hair for a long time, but, you know, I, I wouldn't be excited about the general trajectory of my decaying body. And so I wouldn't be interested in looking at, you know, 15 years worth of photos of James. Uh, no, the reason I like this app is because it shows me 15 or more years worth of photos of my children. And it allows me to, like, experience a little bit of nostalgia to reminisce about what they looked like five or 10 or 15 years ago. I say all the time that I love the season of life that I'm in right now. My kids can all brush their own teeth. They can all make their own sandwiches, which means they are somewhat self-sufficient and independent. Um, they're becoming adults, and we get to have adult-like conversations with them all the time. We're preparing to send some of them into the world, hoping that they don't come boomeranging back to us. We love the season of life that we're in. But I pull that app out and look at the photos of what my kids looked like, not today at age 17, but, you know, 17 months old. I pull that app out and I look at 17 years worth of Christmases, 12 years now worth of first days of school, and I can remember, like, their littlest years, those moments when they were small and tender and so dependent upon us. And I won't lie, there, there are times when I look at those photos and I think, I would give my right arm to be able to go back to that season of life, to be able to hold my kids when they were really tiny again, to go through like first steps and, and first words and first, first days of school again. Those things, they just seem so sweet and precious to us. And I wish I could just, I wish I could just bottle that up and keep it forever and ever and ever. Those moments, those memories, you're so sweet and so precious to us. Psalm 1611 says that in the Lord's presence there is fullness of joy and that at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Which means that every joy we experience in this life will be just a faint echo or shadow of the joy that we will experience when we meet the Lord face to face. Every joy we experience in this life is just a faint echo or shadow of what we will know when we are with the Lord. Which means that all of our longings in this life, they're really just longings for Jesus. And our sweetest memories in this life, our most precious moments and delights, they're really just a hint at what it will be like when we meet the Lord face to face. Friends, I can't even imagine that. Like, I can't imagine a joy that will make my memories of my kids when they were small seem just like a shadow I can't imagine a joy that will make those moments with my children seem good, but seem less than the joy of experiencing the Lord's presence face to face. I can't imagine that. But I believe that it exists, because this tells us that it exists. Our hope as Christians is that one day we will be with the Lord and if we're in Christ, we will enjoy his presence. And that will be a joy that is sweeter and more precious than any joy we have ever known. It leads me to three questions that I will ask, that I must ask before I'm done this morning. They're brief. Number one, do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus will return to gather his people to himself? Do you believe that Jesus will return to give us fullness of joy in his presence forevermore? Do you believe that Jesus will return to wipe every tear from every eye, to make all things whole and right and new? Do you believe these truths? 
Number two, does your life reflect these truths? In other words, do you live today like this life is all there is? Does eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die? Does that sum up the way you live your life? Or does the hope of Christ's return transform the way you live your life? Does it transform the way you think about money and possessions? Does it transform the way you think about time and vocation? The way you think about family and friends? The way you think about the neighborhood that you choose to live in? The way you think about the activities that you sign your kids up to be part of? The relationships that you lean into? Does the everyday stuff of your life reflect the fact that Jesus will come again and we will always be with the Lord? And then the third question I think is, it's the most important one. Not just do you believe these things, not just does your life reflect these things, do you love these things? Do you love these truths? Do you long for them? Do you long for the day when these truths aren't just promised, but they're realized? Do you long for the day when we'll breathe the air of heaven? Do you long for the day when we'll stand face to face with the one who died and rose again? Do you long for the day when we'll surround the throne of heaven and sing with people from every generation, from every tribe and tongue and nation, when we'll sing with one voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain? Do you love these things? Do you long for them? If not, why not? Let's pray together.